Good morning to you all. Uh, this session is twice important. Uh, we take care of two precious human beings at the same time when obstetric patients are critically ill. We have very special uh, speakers to talk, uh, who are going to lecture us. The first one is Professor Kajal Jain from India. Uh, she is the president of Association of Obstetric Anesthesiologists of India and chairperson of Super Specialty Course Trauma Anesthesia Acute Care. And uh, she's going to talk about management of massive PPH. Stage is yours. Good morning to all of you. And it's so nice to see so many people, you know, still there, attendees still there at the last day and um, early in the morning. So I'll be talking about a very important topic of management of massive postpartum hemorrhage. So we all know when a lady is going to give birth, it's a happy event. We never expect or we do not want to see anything going wrong. But disasters have no place. And especially it holds true for those patients who are massively hemorrhaging after the delivery of their baby. This is because uterus receives blood, fly, blood supply at the rate of 700 mils per minute. And a lady can exsanguinate within eight minutes her entire blood volume. So this is why disasters take place in a happy birthing suite also. And we need to be very mindful because the incidence of this massive PPH is still rising. It hasn't halted. And when we say massive obstetric hemorrhage, we mean a loss of more than two liters. If it happens more than two and a half liters, it is, uh, it is then defined as catastrophic hemorrhage. And this is one hemorrhage which requires a war footing like a scenario where you have to be on the same page with your friends because if you do not do so, then too little is done too late. And as I said, this is mostly because we fail to diagnose this extremely important thing of quantifying blood loss because we are not in consensus. Say for example, your OBGY may say, no, patient hasn't bled enough. So severity of hemorrhage is not quantified adequately because we believe on guesstimates. We just guess around what is the blood loss. We do not have protocols. We do not have a proper training in many centers. And the eutotonics dose and the use is not clearly defined in many, in many places. There's a delayed decision to transfuse. We ignore the clinical signs because we think that the patient is still fine because she's young. And we tend to ignore those labs. And then, again, there's a failure to make a decision. In some places where there is lack of adequate equipment, teamwork errors and communication failures are also of paramount importance. Put together, we are always late in managing our ladies. And then there are certain physiological changes like the physiological hypervolemia of pregnancy, which masks the early signs of hypotension uh, and hemorrhagic shock. Then early coagulopathy is relatively uncommon in postpartum hemorrhage unless the case is of an abruptio or uh, AFE or pulmonary embolism. And we have to remember that hemorrhaging pregnant women or, or a postpartum hemorrhage has depletion of fibrinogen the earliest. This has been seen in many studies and therefore we need to risk stratify these women. Like which are those women who are at risk of bleeding so that we can do a pre-transfusion laboratory testing, type hole type screen cross match and uh, that, that's how we can save our mothers. This has been given by the three societies. The Society for Women's Health and Nursing and CMQCC and ACOG. So what does it say? It says that you categorize the women into three the ones which can be in the green way, like the ones which do not have any previous uterine incisions, they have less vaginal birth, they have no bleeding disorders, they have no history of PPH and have a singleton pregnancy. But those who have an induction of labor, more than four vaginal births, prior cesarean section, scar, large uterine fibroids, or morbid obesity, estimated birth weight is more than four, four kilograms, be warned. And if the patient is actively bleeding, she has more bloody show than expected. She has abnormal placentations 
or she has a known coagulopathy, she, then these risk factors, they qualify as high risk. And any of the two or more medium risk items, they are classified as high risk, means you should be well prepared. And such women, if they have a loss of even more than 500 mils th during their vaginal delivery, should be actively looked for tachycardia, more than 100 beats per minute, in spite of uh, balanced volume state, shock index, that is heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure. If it shoots beyond 0.9, you should be watchful. Lactates more than 4. Coagulopathy detected either by clinically or by viscoelastic testing. Hypotension. Clinical blood gas values like your base excesses are, are now rising up to more than 4. Our pH is dropping. Or patient is not, not diuresing properly like she is showing low urine output. Or patient is turning agitated. She is showing signs of hypoxia. All these things should warn you that I need to be careful and have to watch this woman for a, a progression in hemorrhage. And if the losses are more than a liter, which is now uh, quantified by or classified by WHO as a major blood loss, then you have to activate your postpartum hemorrhage protocol. And here with postpartum hemorrhage protocol, I want you to highlight that do not think only and only about blood transfusion. It should be replaced by another terminology, which is called massive hemorrhage protocol. And it has seven points. Like you trigger the protocol is the first one. You prepare your team and you look at the team performance. You give tranexamic acid to a bleeding patient. Do the test labs hourly, transfuse to, to targets, manage the temperature properly. And you should also remember when to terminate the protocol, when you should inform your blood transfusion uh, that we do not need any more blood. So the first step is, if your patient is hemorrhaging massively, please ensure that you have an MDT team, team which is available and it responds to your call. Immediately, you should know who is the team leader. You should announce what is the cumulative blood loss. You should have a checklist. You should read it out, read out the vital signs, and determine the stage of hemorrhagic shock, class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4. Here, I am dealing with class 4 hemorrhage means blood loss is more than two, two and a half liters. Remember to stop the catastrophic bleeds because you have to go with the first, you have to stop leaking tanks. Unless you don't stop the leak, you are not going to reach anywhere. So, uh, we, and we all know what are the most important causes of postpartum hemorrhage, atony. So, atony is the most important cause of um, postpartum hemorrhage and you must know how to use your eutotonic in proper doses and routes. Ensure that you have a whiteboard IV access and warming devices to ensure normothermia. And preoperative antibiotic prophylaxis should also be given. You must also be watchful of not overloading your patients with crystalloids. One to one and a half liters of lactated drinker solution is good enough while you're waiting for the blood and blood products to come. And we have all learned by now that hemostatic reanimation is should be early and aggressive. And we go hand in hand. Shock pack. 1 is to 1 is to 1. And the lab tests are sent for serial hematocrits. You also look at ionized calcium, potassium, creatinine, and ABG. Platelets, prothrombin, partial prothrombin time, and fibrinogen levels should be sent as standard lab tests. But point of care testing is emerging as a new method of management of postpartum hemorrhage. Why? Because they give you timely results. They are the golden tools to identify hyperfibrinolysis. And they are, as I said, modern patient blood management tools. And they can avoid overtransfusion, which is very, very important. You don't want the patient to land up in trolley and taco after all this uh, management. Whereas your standard lab tests have a disadvantage because PT and APTT, they fall much later. And the standard lab tests have a very big turnaround time. You send the sample, it comes back to you very late. And fibrinogen is a predictive marker. But and will, while PT and APTT are less useful. So FFP is not ideal for making uh, managing your hyperfibronemia hyper because it contains low concentration. So try not to use it because you replace uh, only a very small amount uh, of fibrinogen, whereas bleeding pregnant patients require a higher fibrinogen level to clot, more than two. It, it, the values are between four to six. So how do you do it? You do a, uh, your tag, your rotum testing, and if the FIPTEM levels are less than 12, 
you give a fibrinogen concentrate, which is available now. I'll be talking about it. And if you need massive transfusion where you do not have the time to do any testing and you see the patient has uh, lost more than two and a half liters, you can give an empirical dose of synthetic fibrinogen. Or you can also give a synthetic fibrinogen if the patient has got abrupt or AFE, which is you, you know is associated with coagulopathy. If there is an ongoing bleed and you're not able to test properly, then you, you can include platelets. And if the patient continues to bleed, despite all your efforts, please suspect factor 13 deficiency also, which can be corrected by giving cryoprecipitate. Cryoprecipitates are the only ones which carry factor 13 in adequate uh, numbers. So the decrease in fibrinogen is an early predictor was studied in a very, very elegant study, a multicentric study of involving 128 women. And in this study, the area under the curve shows that this is the first marker to tell you that the patient is actively hemorrhaging. So please do not ignore low fibrinogen levels in a hemorrhaging pregnant women or a postpartum woman. We all are you, uh, aware that tranexamic acid has a big role to play in active bleeding. Try to give tranexamic acid to women early on within three hours and the dose is one gram given over uh, 10 minutes and you can repeat it if the patient is bleeding. So what does tranexamic acid do? It doesn't let uh, plasminogen get converted to plasmin and then the subsequent reaction doesn't take place. And more importantly, tranexamic acid is available to all of us and it is in low price. WHO has strong recommendations. Sorry. WHO has got strong recommendations for giving tranexamic acid. In order to prevent uh, your coagulation cascade uh, non-clotting, we have to think that no longer we are talking about lethal triad. We are talking about lethal diamond. Role of calcium has come up in a big way because calcium figures in at a lot of places in your coagulation pathway. It's a cofactor in many, many reactions. So if you do not give calcium adequately, Calcium is also lost due to massive transfusion. Calcium is also being lost due to massive hemorrhage. And then calcium doesn't uh, allow certain reactions to take place in the coagulation cascade. So it's very, very important that we replace calcium uh, adequately. So this is the synthetic fibrinogen. It is available all over the globe now. And it's available as a Zeria sap. You have to just reconstitute the mixture with water. That's the only drawback. And it can, uh, it's given in this range of 30 to 60 milligram per kg body weight. So it is much better to give than FFP and cryoprecipitate. So factor replacement, uh, so prothrombin PCC. PCC concentrates have now come into the market, which contain vitamin K dependent clotting factors. However, they have not been yet approved and we do not have any clinical trials in PPH. So the role is yet awaited. For recombinant uh, activated factor 7A, it has been recognized as efficient in terminating PPH refractory, refractory to escalated eutotonic therapy and sufficient hemo hemostatic management. If the patient still continues to bleed, then you can use factor 7. But be mindful, you should have fibrinogen more than 2 grams, platelets more than 50,000, adequate temperature and adequate pH for factor 7 to act. So mostly this becomes very difficult because once your patient is bleeding, these things are not going to be so stable. So what would be the best strategies then? The best strategies to revise would be to keep the temperature of the woman at 36.5, pH more than 7.2, ionized calcium uh, between 1 to 1.6, use tranexamic acid 1 gram and again if the patient is bleeding, try to do diagnostics using point of care testing and transfusion should be initiated with 1 is to 1 is to 1. You, what should you target? You should target a hemoglobin of 7, platelets of more than 75,000, fibrinogen more than 2, and so on. So if the patient is still bleeding, as I said, then you can consider factor 7. However, if you still are unable to manage, it's time to head for either interventional radiology, for uterine embolization, glue, whatever you see on their findings, or to the emergency room for a peripartum hysterectomy or uterine loo or uh, stitching up of lacerations, whatever is the problem there because you have to stop the bleed. And don't forget that these women will require some degree of care after their uh, protocols are uh, de-escalated because they may even go to HDU, they may require uh, uh, ventilation for a day or so. 
so please be mindful of looking at how you will look after them after they have stopped bleeding so the postpartum morbidities mainly are aki and then uh, it is um, sepsis febrile morbidities and then multi organ dysfunction can happen to anybody so these are the most important things with which these patients land up into icu the clinical pearls uh, which you can gather at the end of the, the this my lecture is have your own standard operating procedures audits debriefing and huddles after each event try to do simulations pph drills and you should know how to initiate prompt and adequate therapy you should know how to monitor these patients and how to do your viscoelastic testing and, and judicious use of eutotonics and how to initiate tranexamic acid and fibrinogen therapy in these women thank you very much this is my institute and the city from where i come it's up in the north of india it's called chandigarh designed by a french architect lee kabuto it's a very well planned city if you ever happen to come to india you are welcome to have a look at this city thank you very much we would love to thank you for your nice presentation i would like to move fast and not to lose more time the second presenter is professor anju garwal from aims but in the india she's going to talk about maternal critical care improving but far from real far from ideal very good morning to all present thank you so much for the kind introduction uh, so taking you further uh, we'll be talking about maternal critical care improving but far from ideal so in the next 15 minutes we'll look at what do we mean by an ideal maternal critical care Uh, what are the limitation and challenges that we think are in there in our own settings and what are the improvements that have happened over the period of time in maternal critical care and do we have some solutions for future so i do not have any conflicts of interest um, in this talk so uh, what makes maternal critical care unique as you all would agree that as we are delivering obstetric care and critical care interventions to these you know mothers who are critically ill what we need to remember that we need to also look at the various physiological changes of pregnancy that are going to mask early detection of the mother getting sick the threshold parameters and the responses need to be adapted to the new normal of the pregnancy that's very important and of course we also have a baby on board that needs to be looked after and then once born we need to also look at aspects of breastfeeding and bonding so all of these go hand in hand with this critically ill mother So what should you think are the components of ideal maternal critical care as you all would agree first and foremost is early recognition of clinical deterioration and what's important and pertinent is to use scores that are obstetrically validated for this population and we robustly monitor them more often than not women are actually pushed up in a corner of the labor room suits where they are hardly monitored and therefore we lose that window of opportunity where we can recognize them early and prevent them from going getting critically ill and other a point is very important is that we need to have patient centered multidisciplinary care and there's a concept of critical care without walls would be that we can take a critical care to the labor rooms to the wards of antenatal wards where these mothers are or even in remote locations we can guide them out so that an early transfer can occur in these patients and therefore you need to have efficient critical outreach care teams for these purposes and of course we need to have standard of cares that i said will address both the pregnancy related and critical care needs of the mother and for these we'll need logistics equipment transfer referrals sops all of these smoothly interlinked to each other so this is something that we are kind of looking at the entire picture up there where we are trying to encompass mothers at various levels of care whether it is a simple basic care that we are looking at the level 1 and the level 2 care uh, and or we are you know escalating care taking them either in the critical care to the wards to the labor wards or taking them to sub specialty centers or you know further higher up regional or perinatal healthcare centers so this is this is an amalgamation of a lot of multidisciplinary work that we are looking at and therefore we need to understand that these are the these are the very valuable resource of a country which need uh, you know attention up there and why are we talking about it is simply because we all understand that you know though we have had a drop in our mmr rates 
we need to understand that we still have some spikes occurring across each part of the country. And what is really you know, frightening is that every two minutes, a pregnant woman dies because of a preventable cause of death. And more often than not, not as we had a talk on massive uh, obstetric hemorrhage, we have a talk coming in, in for pulmonary embolism, hypertensive disorders, sepsis, all of these make a major chunk of severe maternal morbidity requiring intensive care. And therefore, timely diagnosis and safe management is important. And what has been a big shift is the fact that we have moved from obstetric critical care to maternal critical care, meaning thereby that we are focusing on the mother. We're trying to take critical care to her doorstep rather than get her to our ad adult ICUs and let her be left in lurch. So <clears throat> what are the challenges in doing so? Um, in a country like as vast as uh, mine, India, that I come, there's a huge disparity between uh, clinical care settings. So there would be rural settings which have re remote locations, difficulties in reaching to the hospitals, and then there are urban settings which are absolutely at par with the best centers across the world. Then there are differences because of literacy, awareness of mothers, the socioeconomic barriers that these women have, and of course, very important is the number and the type of healthcare providers. If you look at the WFSA recommendations, they need a density of anesthesia providers of more than 20 or at least five per 100,000 population. And in India, we have less than three physician anesthesia providers per 100,000 population. So we do have a manpower crunch that needs to look at. So as I said, we have a lot of challenges across the globe in various parts. Of course, if you're coming from a high resource center, or setting, it would be lesser, but in, in low resource settings or in wide uh, geographic locations, you would have delays occurring across all of these, seeking care, reaching the care. But what I feel is what we can address as healthcare providers and as critical care intensivists and specialists is our resources in the hospital once she reaches there, and then we in order to also enhance the quality of community maternal healthcare services so that she doesn't need critical care. If she needs, we need to look at all of these four aspects of uh, you know, multidisciplinary care. And that's readiness, recognition and prevention, response, reporting, and systems learning. So let us look at what improvements have we had till now. We have had a multiple you know, guidelines coming from various societies. So all of these societies are basically trying to provide us uh, you know, guidelines and protocols on human resources, equipment, logistic requirements, workflow processes, and then criteria for escalation of care. So it's very important that we move towards physiological scores. We can screen our mothers well. And as I said, we need to adapt to obstetrically modified scores. So we have the MUIR score. And then, of course, for critically ill mothers who are you suspecting them to getting into sepsis, we have the obstetrically modified Q SOFA scores. So just simple scores which all your, you can teach your midwives on the labor floors to learn how to monitor them, have you know, colored charts so that they know when they're in the red zone or the two yellow zones, they need to escalate care. So that is how we need to you know, provide these kind of tools to our community workers, to our midwives, so that we're able to pick up them faster. Once we have picked them faster, we can also apply. This is something that can be preemptively done even in the antenatal care. You, know, you can have an obstetric uh, modif comorbidity index, which actually looks at the comorbidities a mother might be having, something like preeclampsia, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, which, which, you, which you would see more common in even high resource settings. So these are some of the settings that will help us to escalate care and take the mother to the appropriate care setting. Uh, in, uh, in a, and then we looked after in a proper multidisciplinary way. And when I talk about multidisciplinary way, I mean it's a hybrid model of maternal critical care where you have a combination of an obstetrician, midwife, and maternal fetal medicine personnel working in tandem with the critical care outreach or the obstetric anesthesiologist and intensivist together. And of course, you need to be supported by other allied specialties, especially laboratory services, psychologists, neonatologists, and other specialties. So uh, working as a team and is very important, and components of teamwork need to come in very fast for these aspects. And also important is a great improvement that we have seen is in the formation of consensus bundles that have come in. You can actually adapt these bundles to your local settings. So we have bundles, for example, Dr. Kajal talked to us beautifully about obstetric hemorrhage. So they actually encompass the four you know, pillars of readiness, recognition, uh, prevention, 
which is the most important one I feel always, assess the risk of the mothers and actively manage so that we do not push them to critical uh, illness. And if do we do happen, we should have a structured, well-planned, rehearsed response and a systems of reporting and learning and auditing these things so that we know what to improve in our systems. Similarly, we have bundles for, uh, you know, pregnancy, uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. We have bundles for sepsis. So we can, in the process of uh, societies need to, you know, actually form, come together. The obstetric anesthesia societies need to come together with intensive care societies and form these huddles and bundles of care so that we can look at these issues in a more structured manner. And we need tools and training to do them. So it's very important that we all, you know, uh, armor ourselves with the skills of uh, echocardiography, focus and obstetrics is coming in in a big way. And therefore, this is something that I think the future uh, conferences and meetings should focus on, you know, um, training your providers into these aspects so that we can take um, quick decisions and escalate care further. What are the new technologies, especially in low resource settings that we can do to our mothers, especially the mothers who are sitting in the rural areas? is we can have like community blood pressure monitoring devices like micro life cradle or there is a VSA vital sign alert with a traffic light early warning system. Even a person who is not a healthcare provider can perhaps you know, be taught a little bit and to understand that if there is a red sign, that's a red flag that we need to move this mother to a higher uh, center. You can also have, uh, there are health apps and this is of course a time of health technology. I was, uh, when I was traveling um, by air, I met a young guy who works into health technology and he talked to me about all the health apps that will help uh, providers in the remote areas to look at whether this mother is getting into, you know, adverse events for uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension or whatever. So all of these devices can be used. And there's, this is something which is new coming up and it needs, um, you know, one-time good investment if you really want to put that to your remote areas of your country. So you have consultation and surveillance, which happens from remote locations, monitoring by the providers who are on there, and therefore together with the help of, uh, you know, intensivists sitting in high-end centers and the providers at the remote locations, we can perhaps give enhanced maternal critical care to these mothers. What is very, very pertinent to have these is teaching and training. So upscaling and and upskilling of your providers is important. And what has been now been recommended is that rather than have more intensivists, we should look at early education so that our MBBS, our basic, you know, trainees, are we are able to train them into how to look at your mothers, how to monitor them. And there is therefore a big role of societies to, you know, reformulate your curriculum, your fellowship programs, enhance the simulation and skills training that are aligned with the obstetric physiology and this is where you need the M in the FMM coming up back. You know, the maternal fetal medicine needs the M back up there. And a lot of mentoring is needed to take on. And of course, we need a lot of support in the form of not only logistics, but also money it needs to come in to uh, you know, escalate these kind of trainings. So towards the end, I, I would say that we are indeed moving towards ideal maternal critical care. And to do this, we need to support the services at all possible locations. We need to in, in, incorporate the concept of critical care without walls. We should have risk monitoring tools and, you know, we need to really look at them with a multidisciplinary manner. As I said, we need to promote early career critical care education and have a fellowship which looks at both obstetric anesthesia as well as obstetric intensive care and obstetric medicine. I would say that's a, something that a hybrid thing that we are looking at and create bundles that, you know, create readiness in every unit, recognition and prevention for every patient, response to every event of the mother and this reporting and systems learning of every unit and a respectful care is something that is very, very pertinent to mothers because more often than not in critical care, they feel alienated when they have a male patient next by and they need to feed the baby, it is something that really needs to be taken care of as all. And we need audits, really, really structured, well qualitative studies that then we can improve our services, have an equitable health landscape for our mothers who can receive standardized care uh, sans the disparities. Thank you so much for this pro kind, uh, attentive learning, and I invite you all to Patna, that is uh, where we are holding our annual national conference in the month of November 20 to 24.
Thank you so much. We thank you for your kind invitation and also for your visionary speech. I would like to invite the third speaker, who is another very distinguished speaker from India, Professor Sagvendir Bajwa, who is going to talk about pulmonary embolism in, in uh, pregnancy, during pregnancy. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think the previous two lectures were so overwhelming. <laughs> I'm afraid that I will be able to do justice to my lecture because they have already dwelled upon the major complications we encounter in the obstetrics. Yeah, it's a science which deals with the infusion of new life. The world would have been a better place had there been not a single complication in these type of scenarios. I think that's we all are here to deliberate upon these type of complications so that to make our practice much safer. Now, the topic is pulmonary embolism. I think many of you must have encountered in your lifetime, numerous times also. But although the incidence is not that high, but complication is very important. So, it is a spectrum. On the left side, you see, it's the most common, that is the venous thrombobolism. And if you go, shift to the right side, these are in a the decreasing order, like amniotic fluid embolism, large air bubbles, then fat drops or tumor embolism. And two, three types, either subsegmental, which is restricted to the pulmonary artery, and then there's submassive and massive. And you define it further, submassive is the systemic hemodynamics are preserved, but the right ventricular dysfunction is there. In massive, the systemic arterial hypotension is shock, which has a high morbidity and mortality. If you talk about the embolism, pulmonary embolism in pregnancy, the risk is five times that of normal women and two times during delivery. And it is a leading cause of, you know, mortality in the developed nations. Although in developing nations, we have got many causes. And estimated incidence is one to two per thousand pregnancies with 7% of pulmonary embolism may present with hemodynamic instability. And it is very common in the first three weeks post-delivery also. If you identify the risk factors, mainly the correlation of three risk factors, first is the venous stars in the lower limbs, the hypercoagulability, and the vascular damage, either because of delivery or the surgical interventions. And there are many risk factors, if you see, but the most important is the, this one, the ovarian hyper, hyperstimulation syndrome. It is coming up. In the new era, there will be uh, researches on this factor because the increasing rate of IVF. So these type of uh, incidences are going to rise. And we will be seeing a many good research paper on these type of uh, syndromes. Diagnosis is always difficult because many physiological changes of pregnancy and the positivity of V-dimer, they do not they mask the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. And it's more importantly, it's very important to diagnose early, otherwise the morbidity and mortality is very high. Because you have to keep a very low clinical threshold to diagnose this complication. And the false diagnosis, chances are always here. And 90% of cases you think it's a pulmonary embolism, it doesn't turn out to be. So we have a huge list of differential diagnoses in these cases. You have to single them out. And act quickly also. This is a list of all the differential diagnoses in the pulmonary embolism. Now, any complication, you have to quantify it. The scores have to be there. So, this is the pregnancy adapted Geneva score. It's one of the scores used to estimate the risk of pulmonary embolism and divided in the low, intermediate, and high. There is an, uh, this one. This score has some merits like that has only the objective items, has good discrimination power to categorize. On the other side, it needs a prospective validation also. There's another score, the pregnancy adapted years model. It's a triad of clinical signs of DVT, hemoptysis, and a PE most likely diagnosis. And these are the flow charts based on which you diagnose the complications. It's a Geneva adapted flowchart. The next is the pregnancy adapted years diagnostic algorithm. I don't want to go into details of this algorithm. It will take time. 
but these algorithms they guide you about the diagnosis and management of pulmonary embolism in one of the studies the authors review concluded that the pregnancy adapted years algorithm is well tolerated and the most efficient diagnostic algorithm for pregnant women with suspected pulmonary embolism going in favor of the years adapted model there are other investigation also chest radiograph important maybe you know the harmful effects on the fetus are there then oxygen saturation lower than 90% then abg analysis ecg changes and echocardiography all these are very much important for the wholesome diagnosis of pulmonary embolism this is important now choice of diagnostic algorithms in different part of the globe different countries you adopt different diagnostic methodologies and how why because which guideline is followed whether you are following the european society of cardiology american college of chest physicians or thoracic society or hematology american society of hematology the diagnostic methodology may vary also depend upon the geographic areas it's for example in the united states the this view cue lung scan is more important and also the user convenience and the local expertise local guidelines availability of nuclear medicine team and last of all the clinical and the patient preference the prevalence of inconclusive test results for both imaging techniques and the, is, uh, these are the very important part the ctp or the vent uh, ventilation perfusion scan because they help to diagnose the pulmonary embolism in a very correct way after diagnosis then we come to the management part this is the most important now first of all you have to do a risk stratification before you start treating these patient with the high risk intermediate or low risk high risk means the hemodynamics instability intermediate where the presence of right ventricle strain is present some elevated biomarkers are there in the low risk there is heart is at least spared in these type of cases then the multidisciplinary team management has already been developed upon by the previous two speakers then anticoagulation is the cornerstone of therapy whether you go for the low molecule weight heparin or unfractionated heparin and the hemodynamics and obstetric solvents is continuously required during treatment systemic thrombolysis is important in the treatment in the massive pulmonary embolisms then there is a catheter directed thrombolysis and thrombectomy then surgical embolectomy though rare it's also part of management ecmo is coming up but used very rarely and the vena cap filters are also there to help in the management and last of all but not the least the planning of delivery that's very important so what is high risk pulmonary embolism is the presence of cardiac arrest hemodynamic instability and if the fetal well being is compromised and how you manage acute massive pulmonary embolism mainly two factors basic factors initial resuscitation and definitive measures so this is a management of pregnancy so the pulmonary embolism based on a high risk intermediate and low risk these charts are algorithms are long time is short i won't be able to highlight every part of it but the main thing is to decide about the anticoagulation therapy at the earliest now coming to the anticoagulants low molecule weight heparin and unfractionated heparin they can be safely used and preferred in pregnancy and postpartum and the less frequent uh, frequent monitoring of apt is required while you are administering these drugs and the dose of low molecule heparin is 1 mg per kg twice daily and while administering these drugs you monitor anti factor 10a levels 4 hours after low molecule weight injection currently there is a little evidence about the direct orally acting anticoagulants during pregnancy and now this is important the resumption of low molecule weight heparin 12 to 24 hours after delivery if on prophylactic dose and 24 hours if higher low molecule weight heparin is being used and is to be continued until 6 weeks postpartum and fonda perinox substituted if allergy to the low molecule weight heparin is there then iv unfractionated heparin can also be used if immediate after delivery the rate you can use 80 units per kg bolus followed by 18 units per kg per hour and is started to to achieve a therapeutic aptt level thrombolysis is not that commonly used but it is a uh, treatment in some advanced centers also 
and mainly used systemic IV is the root. Then fibronolytics, what is the disadvantage? The major bleeding can happen. And there is a harm to placenta leading to the premature labors, fetal or neonatal death. So these are the side effects of fibronolytics. And systemic tissue plasminogen activator is relatively contraindicated in pregnancy because it has a major risk of bleeding and hemorrhagic stroke. Surgical umbilectomy is a rarely used procedure, but I think uh, considering the high risk factor, it can be used. In few centers, there are isolated reports and few studies are also there which have indicated its use of this surgical umbilectomy, but not a good evidence is there. ECMO, now with the COVID, the ECMO has made, uh, acquired a major role and it has made, making strides in almost every part of the globe. And Barring its cost, it is going to be helpful if employed at the earliest. IVC filters are also there, but there are no controlled studies to explore the effectiveness of IVC filters in pregnancy. And the recommendation of use of IVC filters are based on the American College of uh, Congress of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. Newer modalities are also coming up in the treatment of pulmonary embolism like targeted thrombolytic strategies and the dedicated pulmonary embolism response teams, as well as tandem heart teams where extracorporeal centrifugal pump to which oxygenator can be added are coming up. This is important where you having a multidisciplinary approach in the treatment of pulmonary venous embolism. It's an unplanned delivery. There's a one scenario, then there can be planned delivery, and third is elective cesarean section. And all these are depending upon the local preference as well as experience of the obstetrician and anesthesiologist who are going to deal with these cases. And American Society of Hematology 2018 guidelines are there which are very important while we are giving the anticoagulant treatment. If on antipartum therapeutic anticoagulation, scheduled delivery with prior cessation of anticoagulant therapy is required, planned delivery with minimum time of anticoagulant, if antipartum high risk pulmonary embolism is there, switch therapeutic low molecular heparin twice daily, few weeks prior to the planned delivery. And resume anticoagulation after delivery, recommended to wait possible until 39 weeks of gestation. And coming to vaginal delivery, it's a less blood loss, lower infection rate, and less risk of venous thrombobilism, but pregnant women should be clinically stable to tolerate the process of labor and delivery. In unplanned spontaneous delivery, there are increased chances of bleeding, and the problems and limited availability to neuroaxial analgesics also there. And low molecule weight heparin is usually converted to continuous unfractionate heparin infusion greater than 36 hours prior to delivery, especially if neuroaxial anesthesia is planned. And restart low molecule weight heparin after four hours after the epidural catheter removal. In conclusion, timely and accurate diagnosis of thrombobilism in pregnancy is essential but very challenging. Modern management includes anticoagulation, thrombolysis, and surgical pulmonary embolectomy. Systemic anticoagulation is the cornerstone of prevention and therapy. Optimal diagnostic strategy is still not clear. Lack of data and evidence on management strategies of pulmonary embolism in pregnant population is there. Current guidelines vary significantly in their approach to diagnosing pulmonary embolism in pregnancy, basing their recommendation on scant and weak evidence. Early diagnosis and prompt therapy can lead to optimal outcomes, but more data is needed for drug technique, use and safety in management. And with the new modalities coming up, I think we will be more clear in the future. And as Dr. Anju has also highlighted, we welcome you all to our national conference at Patna on 20th to 24th November 2024. All are welcome. We are eagerly waiting to welcome you all there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Can I have you and the other two speakers up yes. here? Meanwhile, I will ask about the questions and the comments from the audience. Are there any questions and comments from the audience? Sir, please. The microphone is coming. Thank you. Okay, so you ask first. Thank you very much for very nice talk. I'm Ove Karlsson from Sweden. And uh, I always missing an important thing on the bundle of care of patients with postpartum hemorrhage. It's 
so easy to temporarily stop the bleeding with just using the fist. In the middle, pressing the orta against the abdominal, uh, against the um, vertebral. vertebral column. It's nearly all the time stop the bleeding. You can gather the team, you can decide what to do, and you save a lot of blood and a lot of time. I can't not understand why we are not using that much or more often. I introduced that in my hospital 20 years ago, and regularly when there is a big postpartum bleeding, the obstetrician and the midwife come with a, in the bed with the patient and sit in keeping the fist against the aorta. We often we can just top up the epidural a little bit. They can take out the placenta, etc., etc. It's a so easy way of saving lives. We must do that better in the world. Absolutely right. Uh, manual compression of abdominal aorta is the technology, is the bedside technique, but it can be restricted to patients who are undergoing C-section. If the patient is antepartum, we have to realize certain limitations that where we cannot use this technique because of the gravid uterus and the site to compress. But if the patient is undergoing C-section and you have an excess, there have been instances where uh, direct compression with your fist, as well as some people have also applied partial clamps. So those things, plus some people also go to femoral and they put a resuscitative balloon occlusion of aorta. Those things are still going on. Yes, they are very much. But postpartum, post when the dia post starts, it's yes. so easy. Yes. And uh, Definitely. Uh, uh, in my institution, we always kept uh, uh, that. And even if there is problem during cesarean section, someone outside can uh, come out and put uh, with the fingers. It's, it's so easy. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions or comments from the audience? I see a hand up there. The mic is coming. <laughs> no. From Nigeria, how effective is the use of an azoparin in the management of pulmonary embolism? That is same. Noxaparin is the same thing. The low molecular heparin we are talking about. Noxaparin is basically you consider the brand name also we got. Very effective. Yeah, it's a to, it's, to it's, many clinic, clinical it's a cornerstone of pulmonary embolism till date. We have not been able to find out the alternative to low molecular heparin. And it is safe. The only thing is about the coagulation parameters if you are going for the neuroaxial anesthesia. And that we have to switch over to the unfractionated heparin. Otherwise, it's a very safe drug to have. The point here is that if you have an epidural catheter for labor analgesia on board and you have embolism and you need to give low, uh, low molecular weight heparin, then pulling out the catheter will need to be timed according to the dose and the timing of yeah, the drugs. Yeah, four hours. After minimum four hours of stopping the, uh, after moving the catheter, after four hours you can, uh, this one, start the low molecular weight heparin. Good morning. Very nice presentation. I have a doubt. How do we diagnose uh, amniotic fluid embolism? Uh, in our institute, we had a patient. The obstetricians were busy trying to deliver the baby. But uh, while delivering the baby, in the, while putting the episiotomy, they found that the field was bl uh, bloodless and the mother was dead. But she had no other comorbidities. Yeah. Amniotic fluid embolism is uh, very difficult to yeah. diagnose yeah. on the table especially. Diagnosis by exclusion. Uh, basically, when you diagnose such cases, you have to go retrospectively what is happening. Because you have got a very limited time to resuscitate the patient. The primary aim is to resuscitate then and there only. Finding the cause can be later on. And you, if you see the diagnostic parameters, the ECG strain pattern, they will be helping. But by the time that patient is almost into the irreversible shock. so. Diagnosis can be established later, but in these type of cases, the primary aim is to resuscitate this patient in whatever way possible, on the table or off the table later on. Critical care is also there. Yeah, so on. I would actually say that, you know, when they are delivering vaginally, more often than not, we forget to monitor our patients. 
so midwives and assistant uh, you know on the on the junior people on the staff should be told to monitor the mother especially the mentation the tachycardia going up there these are early markers that can tell us that the mother is deteriorating and if you catch them early because it's a diagnosis of exclusion you would be able to resuscitate otherwise it's a pretty fatal co complication uh, again about this mentation these patients are in severe pain mm -hmm. and they are uh, disorientally blabbering and it's a little difficult so to differentiate. having in pain, it will not make them disoriented. So we have to learn that distinction of they're losing their mentation, the confusion, that agitation coming in. And on the other hand, pain, they would still not lose their focus. They will not be able, they'll be able to answer you well, right? They might have pain, that severe pain. And of course, we need to encourage uh, analgesic methods. Labor analgesia coming in in a big way so that we are not, you know, confusing up there in the with this uh, what issue is there. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I'm going to ask one. What do you think of dedicated obstetric critical care units uh, in special hospitals for mothers and child care? Will they help to, to have better outcomes with uh, critically ill obstetric patients? That would be, you know, I would, I would say ideal, uh, provided, uh, yeah, but then provided you have the number of, adequate number of health personnel up there, you know, to have dedicated people, obstetric anesthesiologists, intensivists, and obstetricians, uh, maternal fetal medicine specialists up there. So if you have those kind of uh, personnel and resources, that's ideal. That definitely would have a better outcome. Uh, having a mother in an adult ICU and being cared for will have lesser because your input from obstetric care is missing in those areas. Okay, thank you. We have a question from online. Um, in treating PE in pregnancy, what is our expectant PT, PTT, or INR ratio? Uh, I didn't get what you said. Pardon? In treating pulmon embolism in pregnancy, mm -hmm. what is our expecting PT slash PTT or INR ratio? In treating pulmonary embolism in pregnancy, what are our goals regarding coagulation? Coagulation parameters. Coagulation parameters actually are very, when you diagnose these coagulation parameters, you come to their values. But you have to start basically the low molecular heparin. So these are deranged, definitely. But the derangement is not to that standard which you think that they don't require a treatment. Because you have to start the low molecular heparin. Only for that matter you want the levels. Otherwise, there is not much disturbance in the initial stages. But what is our goal with heparin? Not no, no molecular weight. I think 1.5 times is the recommended one. 1.5 times. For the iron, for the what? If we use coumadin, the INR ratio for coumadin. Warfarin. 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 So I think then go to the two times. I think then. Two times. Okay. Mm. I hope you could hear it. Any other questions or comments? Then I would like to close the session and I would like to thank you all for your nice talks. Yes, please.